All right. We are about to do some business, ladies. First of all, did anybody have questions on the homework? The homework is really for you as a starting point to really start digging into your business, start digging into your motivations for your business and filling out that canvas. So are there any questions before we get started on last week's assignment, any of the presentations, the canvas, the video? I kind of got stuck on my how. Oh, excuse me. My name is Kayla. I am with Inspire. I am not prepared for my question. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is all right. Okay. My name is Kayla Kelly Birch, owner of Inspire. We help celebrators with celebratory events. We offer cakes and treats. I did not offer, I didn't make this better and I apologize. No need to apologize. By uplifting spirits. Yes. That is what I got. And I'm trying to make that better. Well, let me just give you a little pointer here. Is okay. don't, don't look for something that's going to make it more difficult. Just really think about if you were a customer of yours, what words would you need to hear to make you say, that's who I want to do business with. Your who needs to really just identify your target customer. Um, celebrators, I don't know that I'm a celebrator. I don't, there's nothing to tell me, is that me? So you can simplify that. My, with what, by how, those are your wow statements and your why statements. So really think simpler than making it more wordy and, and complicated. Okay. But I was trying to figure out my how, my, my purpose my, or my process um, in the homework when I was filling out my circle chart. Mm -hmm. I got stuck on what my process was or my how. I couldn't figure out that what, box. What is your why? to provide unique custom cakes. Now, and I will again talk to you as business owners. It's Aunt Viv right here. When we're talking about things like our why, our how, what we do from a process standpoint, who our target customer is, it's really not about our product. You're gonna see an example of a canvas tonight. And when that, when you look at that, I want you to think about how that language is straightforward, but at the same time, not literal. I think that's where we tend to get caught up as we're trying to make a, a literal connection and use words that specifically tell what we do. What our benefit is, is what we do. So Kayla, when you're thinking about your how, you got to think of what's the benefit that I provide? What do people get out of doing business with me from a benefit standpoint? That's going to really direct and guide you when you're talking about what the process is. Because once you know that, once you know the what, or excuse me, the why, then you know the how. Does that make sense? Yes. Good, good. Anyone else have questions? Yes. yes. <laughs> Little bit of feedback. You're muted now. Carla, you're, you're, Carla. Uh Okay. Okay. I got it. <laughs> okay. I got it together now. Okay. Um, I was trying to get on my computer and disconnect my phone and I got scrambled. Okay. I, um, I was okay with the homework and everything. I, my question is this, I actually just had a question about like the program in general. Cause like last week, uh, we heard a lot about 
people, the, the, the people that are going to be guiding us through these classes in the process. And a lot of the people sounded like um, financiers, but I also wanted to know like who all ran businesses, how long were you in business and, and things like that? Because, um, you know, I, I just would want to know. Sure. Me, myself. I have a business. My business is Ujuzi. I've been doing small business training. I've been in the training industry for over 25 years, small business training for about seven years now. And I have been doing this class. We did that this class, one cohort last year, and done the uh, Rochester Schools Modernization Program. We did nine cohorts of an 18 week small business training. And your other facilitators are actually from Citizens Bank. So they've been in their business for quite some time. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't get that. Uh, you kind of cut out. Okay, you Carolette, said they what? Carolette, do you have music or something playing in the background? Because that's what's coming through. It, sound, it sounds like someone. You else. guys can hear that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me. Okay, I'm gonna have to get up and turn that off. Um, you um, but you had said uh, you said the other people had what? I I I didn't. You cut out on that last little part. They're from Citizens Bank, so they've been in the business for some time. Those are your other facilitators. Anyone else? All right, well then we'll get started because we got a lot of stuff to go over tonight. We're gonna to finish the canvas. We're going to see a completed canvas and then we're gonna look at capacity calculations. So with their early stage business canvas, we talked about uh, your why, your how, your sweet spot. Now we're gonna get into the money. Now we're gonna get into capacity. So the Lefts or the bottom right side of the canvas is about your revenue streams and your revenue per unit. That means how much money do you get per unit of your business? And you should be able to determine one unit of your business. Your costs, that's that negative, those negative dollars, the money that's going out of your business. What are the costs associated with each of your units? And then what are those indirect costs? Then your operations, what's your capacity? How much can you output to be able to calculate the amount of revenue that you're gonna get per unit? And I'm going to break it down as much as possible, but what I encourage you to do is start using these, these words, revenue, your direct costs, your indirect costs, or overhead. These are language, this is the language of business owners. So we're all business owners out here. We wanna be able to talk to business owners in that same language. So here's the canvas again. We're gonna be focusing tonight in this revenue section here, this cost section here, and this operations section here. So how does your business generate revenue? And I wanna to talk to people who think they have multiple revenue streams. So if, let me see, I'm gonna call on Mildred Strader Robinson. Are you here this evening? Mildred? I'm not hearing you, so we're going to go to Dara Randolph. Oh, there's Mildred. Hi, sorry, there's a lot of background. That's all right. Um, okay, what was your question? I apologize. That's all right. So the first is, my name is owner of... My name is Mildred Strader Robinson. I am the owner of Universal Care Services. I support families and their aging loved ones um, creating care plans and schedules so that they can age at home in place. I love that. It's really good. 
So now, how does your business generate revenue? Uh, we provide care into the home, I guess. That's what the answer would be. Um, and we charge a, a rate per hour of um, $28 an hour. So that's how we make our re revenue. And is that your sole revenue source for your business? Yes. Okay, great. So when you talk about, when we talk about revenue, revenue is the money that's coming in from your sale, sort of like your gross salary. You get that money in, it's a, a big dollar amount, but then you have to deduct the costs. When you deduct the costs, it's just like your actual pay, your take-home pay, which is your profit. So when you're looking at your $28 an hour, do you know what your costs are for that? Um, right now, uh, my costs are fairly low as I operate um, from home. I have had an office space prior um, and didn't find that space to be utilized enough to keep it at the time. So right now our costs are very low, just gas and you know maybe gloves and uniforms. So um, costs are very low for that right now. Okay, good, because we're going to be talking about some of those other costs that you're going to want to include in your, uh, in your calculations. Looks yes, like other than cell phone, website, um, and insurances I've had in the past. Um, uh, unfortunately, with small business, they tend, it tends to be up and down, and sometimes you can't afford those insurances. And um, so those things go. And um, so right now, all we have is like phone website, gas, and um, whatever supplies we use, which is only gloves, masks, and uniform. I would caution you to say that no matter what, you find a way to, to afford insurance because right. it can take you, not only take you out of business, but affect yes. your personal finances as well. Yes, definitely. All right, thank you. Yep, thank you. Looks like Kiera has a question. Yes. Hi, Auntie Kim. I'm sorry. I'm on my way home to sit down and soak it all in. But um, I utilize a PL statement. Um, is that is that um, is that beneficial to use when it comes to your your revenue and your cost? Is that okay? It is okay, and you should be using one. That's good. A PL for all of you. That's a profit and loss statement. But you also want to have this, and we're going to talk about this next week with Citizens Bank, are your cash flow. So you want to see that going in and out, the actual day-to-day, -day, and your balance sheet to make sure that your liabilities and your assets are aligned. So good work with the profit and loss. We'll be talking about that in detail next week. Okay, thank you. Sure. And Kim, I know there's just a question in the chat. Ashley is asking when you have multiple units and unit prices, um, would they write them all? Would, would, would they write all of them individually? Yes, and we're gonna see that in the example. All right, thank you. Yes. So revenue streams are really, what they should be is additional offerings within your business. I often hear people say, well, I have multiple revenue streams. I wash cars, I bake cookies, and I clean houses. Well, those are not revenue streams. Those are sources of income. And depending on the level of that business, they might just be hustles, which is cool if you wanna have a hustle. But if you really wanna talk revenue streams, I will give you an example of a, a, a banquet space. If someone has a banquet, room that they rent out for events, but then they also rent decorations. Those decorations would be an additional revenue stream because they are part of what that customer would already buy, but probably from someone else if they didn't have that. So if that makes sense, they can also add in something like uh, planning services. So if somebody's hosting an event, they might need planning and they will need decorations in addition to the banquet space. So that person would bring that all under their umbrella and be have multiple revenue streams. When you're talking, and those are verticals, when you're talking horizontal revenue streams, that is saying, 
okay, I have a supplier, somebody who gives, who sells, um, like Alibaba is a good example. They say, I'm going to buy a bunch of wholesale items, put my name on it, and that's on this side of me, and that could, that supplies me. And then maybe on this side of me, so say thinking of, uh, I'm trying to think of a good decoration, those candles, floating candles. This supplier is over here is a floating candle supplier. So I have that over there. That's a business, but it's a separate business from my event business. And then on this side, maybe I have a transportation company that does the delivery of rentals. Those are horizontal revenue streams. Things that come into the business, but I can use separately. They're connected to the business, but not directly connected, if that makes sense. Businesses our size will probably focus and should focus on verticals. What can I provide my customer in their life cycle? Because I think I mentioned last week, you don't want to have an offering that's a one and done. They only need to come to you one time, they're good, and now you constantly have to go out and acquire new customers. Does anybody have questions with that? Um, it looks like there's a question in the chat. Kira is asking, is that being a monopoly? That's not being a monopoly. Uh, monopoly is someone who like RG&E will not let anyone else in because they have the, the pipes, they have all the supply uh, ducts or whatever they're called. And they've made that investment. Nobody else can get in. That's a situation when you have a, a horizontal or even a vertical, that uh, revenue stream, that's just regular business. Carolette. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't do my thing last time. Carolette Meadows Aqua Grow. Okay, um, now with me, I do have multiple revenue streams, but I, f I'm, I think they're all verticals. So, because for me, the one stream would, of course, be the, the food itself. But then I also have the capacity to build systems for residences. And then I also have the capacity, if a resident wanted, to have them contract me to maintain their systems in their homes if they if they chose if they didn't want to try to maintain their own systems now when you say system what describe what that means in connection to the food what is the what system is it oh like i can do i i know i i can build many i can build many home grow systems where you can you can pretty much when you you can build like small you can grow small scale produce right within your own home mm -hmm. and I can build small systems. Mm -hmm. And again, when you're talking about a vertical revenue stream, the, the key here is that it's something that the, your original customer would most likely already or also need. And now you're just going to provide that. So in the course of your business, would a customer, would that be a natural progression for your customer to need a home system set up? No. Um, some people would just be re repeat customers and have no intention whatsoever of trying to do this in their own home. Um, and I would imagine that the majority of people would have absolutely no intention of trying to do this in their home. Uh, most people probably would not even have the space given, you know, children, pets, and things like that. Um, but for people who did want to do it in their homes, you know, it, it's not like you're going to be able to produce a lot. Like you can like feed your entire family with this system. It's, it's just something like fun to do. Like um, uh, I did it for a friend of mine just so that her daughter could see you know, how, how fish make things grow. And it was just a really small thing. And, 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 and I did it for her daughter, 
And um, so, you know, it, it's not like they were growing anything big or major. It was just a fun project for her daughter to see. Okay. So when we go back to last week, we talk about the business has to solve a problem. And then that problem has to be big enough for people to pay for. So when you're looking at a revenue stream, I'll give you an example. I had a business where I was doing event planning, decoration, consulting, rental. There was like all these different silos. But then when you look at which ones actually make the most money, and then which ones need require the most effort, the ones that I was doing that required the most effort actually made the least amount of money. So that was an easy cut to say, we're not doing that anymore. Because apparently it's something that I could do, but not big enough that people wanted it and were willing to pay for it. So that's what you wanna think about, even though it's something you can do, is that something that your customers will want and be willing to pay for that level of effort. Okay, uh, any other questions on that? So now we're gonna look at how much revenue is generated per unit. This one can be tricky for some people. I know that people that I do business with, when you say, well, what's a unit of your business? What's, what equals one? And the businesses that do a lot of custom work love to say, well, it depends. Depends on if you want this, if you want that, if you wanna do this, I can do that. And I'm saying you want to, you as the owner want to bring it down to a single unit. And it may be that, as you'll see in the example tonight, the packages, you'll have a package A, a package B, a package C. And there was a very defined group of uh, tasks inside those packages. And those packages allow you to assign a specific level of effort. Because until you know exactly how long it takes you, you have no idea what your labor costs are. And the, your labor costs need to be calculated into your direct costs. So everybody got that? So you want to be able to say, in order to sell or to deliver package A, these are things that are included in it. This is how much time it takes. Because your business model should include somewhere down the line, you're hiring someone that someone is gonna to have to be paid a rate. You need to know when you can afford to hire that person based on the amount of effort required for that task. So when you think of how you sell your items, that should give you a good clue on how to bring it down to a unit. Does anybody have questions on that? Okay. Here's a question. Uh, the pink tub, it says, I have a question about our brand regarding units that we sell within our products. Okay, where are we? Uh, the pink tub, do you want to unmute yourself? Let's see. Hi, thank you. I'm um, sorry about that. Thank you. My okay. name is Victoria. I am the uh, founder and creator of the pink tub. We're an opulent, organic, handmade body and bath brand. We make all of our products from scratch. We use a five five three method, which is five vitamins, five moisturizers, and three antioxidants. What that method does, it restores, replenishes, and rejuvenates your skin back to a healthier form and glow. I am a eight year triple negative breast cancer survivor. My second round of chemo, thank you so much, just made eight years out this past Friday. Um, triple negative breast cancer is one of the most aggressive type of breast cancers to have. My second round of chemo, I came up with that method um, going through four and a half uh, hours of chemo, uh, six months of chemo because my, my breast cancer was very aggressive. And so what that method does again, it restores, replenishes and rejuvenates your skin back to a healthier form and glow. Um, I had um, gotten some um, iodine so they can look into my lymph nodes to see if there was any cancer in there. And so from uh, being um, injected with the iodine, I had hives all over my body. So they could not 
um, uh, do uh, the mastectomy, uh, the, my whole um, surgery, which was four surgeries in one day. Um, that was just removing the lip notes. Uh, removing, uh, I had a um, partial tummy tuck because that's the closest fat to your um, breast tissue. I'm sorry, it's a lot of information. Um, but um, that's how I came up with the method going through um, the iodine episode, which um, gave me hives. And then I went back into the kitchen, came up with that method. Um, I redefined that method after going through sec uh, second round of chemo, uh, which my skin became three shades three hues darker. And so I went back into the kitchen, reevaluated re what oils and butters that would help my skin. And so that's how I came up with the 553 method. And we're actually, um, we have a part, oh, I'm sorry, we have a, a temporary patent on that method as of today. Great. Um, thank you. And so my question is, uh, we started a monthly subscription and we started it back um, over a month, uh, a month and a half ago. And my goal was just to get 25 people to um, have membership as well as subscription. If you have membership, you get 20 to 30% off that monthly subscription. So the starting of it is $49.95. But if you are a member, which is $7.95, the perk is you get at least 10 to 20% off. Um, no more than 30%. So instead of paying at $49.95 for the first monthly subscription, you'll pay $39.95. And so my question was, we were trying to determine how to calculate that monthly subscription because my goal was 25. We actually have over 72 monthly memberships and subscribers as of today. Nice. Now, Thank you. I, I would... My first question is, what's the difference between a membership and a subscription? Like, if I so, can, I yes. have a membership without having a subscription. You can have membership. Um, it's seven dollars and ninety five cents. It's monthly, and so what you get is you get the in, um, the uh, integral parts of what's going on with uh, any products that's going on sale, anything that's coming out. You get uh, twenty five percent off on every order. Um, and it doesn't matter how many orders that you place within a day. Um, and also you can, um, you, you'll get your um, yearly um, birthday package, which is like $50, that's the, the cap. And you can, ref and you can transfer that uh, gift certificate as well. And then, the per and then the extra perk is, is that you get between 10 to up to 30% off on your monthly subscription. So that's, um, that's the perk, that's the four perks of the uh, member. What's the purpose of separating the membership from the subscription? The purpose is, is that you can be a member. If you don't wanna pay the monthly subscription, that's fine, but you get your 25% off. Um, and, you get, and you get to find out about what deals are coming out, um, what upcoming events we are at, uh, where you vended at ahead of the public. But if I'm, then, if I'm subscribing, do I get that same information? Uh, no, you do not. You, you just, you'll find out about what's, what's going on as far as what um, events we're doing, but that it wouldn't be ahead of time as it would if you are a member. Mm. Um, first, I would say, just listening to that and a little yeah. bit there is you have it sort of flipped where the people spending the most money with you are not getting the most benefits from you. You, as a business, you want people to spend and purchase at the higher level. Right now you're making it very easy for people to just spend $7 with you as opposed to the, what is it? You said $39.99 subscription. Yeah. So- Yeah, well, I'm sorry to interject. Well, go ahead. With the monthly scrub scriber, instead of sub a subscriber, we call it scrub, scrub it up, Doug. Mm -hmm. Subscriber, you would pay, if you didn't have a monthly, if you didn't pay the monthly membership, you would pay $49.95 a month. As opposed to somebody that has the membership, they won't have to pay that, that 50 bucks. They would just pay $39.95. And they're shipping for the first six months is free. Well, but you're... 
not to get too far into this, but yes. it, it sounds like your monthly subscribers don't have to buy. So they could pay $7 a month for the entire year and never buy a product. Whereas your monthly subscribers are buying the product every month, right? Is that right? Um, no. The monthly subscribers, I'm sorry to take up you guys' time. The monthly subscribers, they are just um, the members. They, they can get 25% off on every order and they get intricals about what's going on with the business. But the subscribers are the ones who have the monthly subscription box. And they're the ones that is getting a deal because you get a certain amount of box or you get a certain amount of bars of soap, lotion, and various sizes. Um, as opposed to someone who's just a member, you can just place an order for individual items. Um, but if you, if you can't afford or don't, or don't have um, the funds to get into the um, subscription, a monthly member, then you can just pay your 25% off on every order. And um, the, the, the benefit is, is that you're, you're getting a box uh, as a subscriber and a membership, as opposed to somebody that's a member, they're purchasing these, uh, these um, our products individually. Right. So again, I would, I would look at how your business model is set up so that okay. if there's people who pay seven dollars a month it sounds yeah. like and then there's people who pay 49.95 a month am i right yes ma'am okay so it sounds like the people who pay seven dollars a month are getting quite a few benefits and they don't ever have to buy a product um whereas the people who are subscribing for 49.95 they get a box but they still don't get advance notice they don't get the things that you would expect because they're spending more money with you. So just as an aside, you wanna make sure that the people who are pay, paying $7 feel just a little uncomfortable and feel like they're missing out so that they're from, uh, they're uh, inspired to go ahead and pay that $49.95 a month because that's what you want people to do as a business owner. Right. So now your units, you would have multiple units. You'd have the unit for the scrub scribers who are forty nine yeah. ninety five a month, and the unit for your memberships, which is the seven dollars a month. And then you would, and again, and you'll see this in the example. What are the costs associated with that? What is the revenue associated with that? And do that for each one. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Um, just one more question. If I combine them together, mm -hmm. membership plus subscriber, mm -hmm. um, then wouldn't that be a perk for both of them as opposed to just the uh, monthly um, member? I'm, a, I'm, a not, I'm not one of those that gets boxes, but I am one of those that gets shoes. So ah. Nice. If you look at the model for like shoe dazzle and dust fab you pay a you can skip a month but you essentially pay for a pair of shoes every month and if you don't buy the shoes they kind of get it become a credit for you okay but if you do oh, buy nice. it, you have that but check out what they're modeling and how they set that up and you get loyalty points and whatnot so okay. There's a lot of businesses out there that use that model. And you wanna make sure, again, you're finding ways that people are encouraged to go ahead and spend the bigger dollars with you. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, thank you. Sure. Any other questions before we move on to the next slide? Um, just an FYI for Victoria. I know Courtney put a couple suggestions in the chat for you. So if you want to look through that <laughs> as well at some point. All right. So now we're going to talk about money going out. How much does it cost? This is where folks get a little fuzzy because it's easy to think about the things that are directly in front of you, but some of the other costs that may not be as obvious tend to get missed and they can kind of take your business down. When you're talking about direct costs, 
direct costs are the, all the things that go into the delivery, the production and delivery of your product or service. All the costs, your time, gas, postage, um, ingredients, tools. In other words, if you think of a, if I have a cleaning business and I have the fancy vacuum that sucks the dirt out of 20 year old carpets, that thing is probably expensive and it's an investment in my business. Every single job I do should have a line item or should have a percentage of that vacuum in those costs. Why? Because when that vacuum breaks, I'm going to need to buy another one. That shouldn't come just out of your general profit and hope you have enough profit left over or set aside to buy that vacuum. Every job you use or every job you do uses that vacuum. So you should have a portion of that included to replace it when it breaks. Does that make sense? So when you have a business that uses tools, any kind of tools, that should be included in there. All of your little raw, material, raw materials, if you have categorized them if, as you need to so with small tools or uh, baking tools, any, any way you can think of to group them all together and then do it as a percentage. Because again, you wanna make sure that every bit of your costs are covered and your costs include replacing things that you use on every job. So that's part of your direct costs. Direct costs go into exactly what do you use to produce that product or service. If you make sandwiches and deliver those sandwiches in a business, the Ziploc bags that you put the sandwiches in, those would be direct costs because if you make 12 sandwiches, you're gonna need 12 bags. If you need 250 sandwiches, you're gonna need 250 bags. Does, if you ask yourself, does the cost increase with the number of units I produce? So the, again, we talked about labor costs. You need to include your labor. You absolutely have to know how much a person would cost you to produce that product or service, because when you step out of the picture to run the business, you're gonna have to pay someone else to do that work. And you need to make sure that your business model supports paying that person. Any questions on that? Okay, good. Now, when we're talking indirect cost, those indirect costs are typically what you call overhead. These are the costs that you have to pay it no matter what. To go back to the sandwich example, if you're paying rent in a space that where you make the sandwiches, it doesn't matter if you make 12 sandwiches or 250 sandwiches, that rent is going to be the same. Those are all your indirect costs. You probably have, well, when we grow, right now it's typically us, but when we grow, we might have a secretary or someone who answers the phones. We might have a cleaning person that comes and cleans up the office or cleans up the space where we make those sandwiches. There's all kinds of places that you're gonna have your cell phone, your internet, your utilities. These are all indirect costs. You're gonna to wanna to set a limit on that because when you are talking about direct costs, those tend to, you have more control over that in that if you want to make more revenue, you sell more product. When it comes to indirect costs, those are unaffected by how much you sell. So you wanna really make sure you keep an eye on that and set a limit on it and track it. So you know exactly how much you're spending and when it's time to expand or contract, you know exactly where you have room to do so. Does anyone have questions on that? I'm gonna be providing you with a list that kind of goes over typical overhead costs and direct costs so you can kind of use it to figure out for your business where you're at. 
We do have a couple questions in the chat, Kim. So mm -hmm. Ashley's asking, uh, building insurance, is it an indirect cost? Yes. Okay. And then Cortina asks, uh, how would how would one come up with the price if they are a new business owner? Your business, or excuse me, your price is directly related to your costs. So it's impossible to come up with a good price until you know all of your costs. Because now you want to, if you say you have a, if you have a sandwich business and you're selling sandwiches, you need to know how much it costs you. If that sandwich costs you $12 to make, then you know you can't sell it for less than $12. You have to be able to, and then you gotta say, all right, so that sandwich cost me $12 to make. Then when I add in all my overhead costs, that's another two, two, two to $10 a month, that or per sandwich rather, that I need to add to that. So now I get my price to be $15. I know that I have covered my direct costs, I know that I've covered my overhead indirect costs and I have a little bit of a profit. So pricing comes after costs. Any other questions? Okay, good. Lead generation. This is almost as important as understanding your costs. How do you generate leads for your business? I will say that most of us as small businesses, we are focused on those incoming and inbound leads. What does that mean? That means we put our picture on Facebook, we put a post how we did something great in our business on Facebook, and we hope people click a button or send us a DM and say, hey, I wanna hire you. Our lead generation really should be more targeted, much more of a process so that we can predict it, measure it, and control it. We want to be able to understand where our leads come from, how we get more of them. We talked about our target customer last week. When you develop a marketing plan and a marketing system that speaks to that target audience, then you start finding ways to get in front of them and let them fill your funnel. Uh, who here has heard about a funnel? I'm going to go with uh, Shamiko Harley. Shamiko, are you here? Yes. So my Wonderful. name is Shamiko, and I am the owner and creator of the Salad Grill. Um, my business caters to the community. I would like to say in regards to the community, I think it caters to more of a working woman like myself, a mother that is looking to eat healthy along with her children as well, but it offers options for meal planning as well. Mm, okay. In regards to funneling, I don't think I have the right, or I don't think I know where you're going with it when you say funneling. A funnel is just like a, a literal funnel um, trying to think of um, I don't cook so I was about to try to get a cooking <laughs> thing but I don't know how to use that one so but if you think of something you the thing you put the oil in in the car I don't do that either but I've seen it done <laughs> you take that oil thing that funnel that's the same idea you have leads that come in they go through certain stages of your process and then at the bottom you have customers. You are never going to have as many customers at the bottom as you have with leads at the top. Not every lead is going to become a customer. So you want to make sure you keep the, the number of leads pouring into that funnel because the more you have going into the top, the more you'll have coming out of the bottom. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So your marketing, your lead generation is all about getting people to understand and know who you are, know how to find you, know what you do, and go through a process to be able to determine, do they want to actually do business with you? 
And that is an actual process. I might have a, a document that I can send everyone that kind of illustrates that, but it really, you really have to be purposeful and intentional about generating leads because without that, you're out here just waiting for people to do business with you and hoping people will do business with you. Any questions on that? Okay. Oh, question? Did I see a hand? Yeah, that was my hand. I'm sorry about okay. that. Mm -hmm. My question, I'm so sorry. Um, my question is with the funnel, do you um, know uh, the best um, top two or three uh, software to use? Like either GoDaddy or Shopify? Um, you don't even need any of that for a funnel. Really? You literally can do it with a piece of paper and a pen. So I'm going to send you a worksheet. But really, your lead generation isn't about... Uh, necessarily a software. It's about how you're reaching that target customer, all the different ways that you're reaching out and touching them and making them aware that you exist. Then you collect those people into that funnel. And then those people go through your, and, and I'm going to, it's hard to explain without seeing it, but you have different stages that you take them through in terms of introducing them to your business. Recognize again, I think I said it last week, but it may have been on the office hours. We are all customers. We are all in somebody's funnel. Every time we buy something, every time we look at something and decide, do I wanna buy? Every time we reach out and ask a company, can you tell me more about your product? We are now in their funnel. And it is a process that they take us through that we're oblivious to because we're so used to it. But that's their process. We all need to have a process. That is a business owner thing. It is not just for big businesses. We also need to have that. How do we take our customers through the introduction of our product and services so that they become an actual customer? So I'll make sure I send that out to everyone so that you okay. kind of can see what it what it is and, and how it works. And, and um, my second part of the question, is the funnel connected with a landing page or just it's separate? Your funnel, your landing page can take leads into your funnel. And you'll you'll hear uh, I mean, there's there's a whole course and a whole movement around funnels and click funnels and things like that. But your marketing funnel is a very specific and separate thing, but it, and it is essentially the container for the leads that you capture with your marketing. If you think about it like that. When I perform any kind of marketing activity and I get people to respond, they respond and go into my marketing funnel because you're also going to have a sales funnel, which is different from your marketing funnel. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, just so everyone knows, I did put a screenshot of just a quick visual of a funnel in the chat. Um, so you can click to open it again. Um, Ms. Kim, you know, did say that there's a difference between a sales funnel and a marketing funnel. So take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, but this will give you a, a little bit of an idea of, of how that funnel works. Um, and then there is a question, Kim, uh, in the chat. It says, uh, Shanae, thank you for the pronunciation because I do the same thing with my name. Um, so it says she's only seen funnels with service-based businesses. Can you provide an example with a product-based business? Oh, absolutely. If you think of a cell phone, if you were to reach out to Samsung and say, hey, Samsung, uh, does your new phone have a slot for a, an SD card. They now take you, you, you won't get through that conversation without them asking you your name, your email address, 
and possibly a phone number because people have now gotten into text messaging to, as marketing. So once you give them that information, you're in their funnel. And now they take you and they send you an email campaigns about this new phone and about the features and about how you use it and some of the uh, different uh, product projects that people are doing with it, all with that intention to kind of keep it top of mind and wait for you to go, oh, you know, that's right. I meant to, to take a deeper look at that. So then when you click something in that email to go to one of their pages, then they know they kind of got you in the, into a next stage, the next level of their funnel. And they do that, again, that once you become into that next level of their funnel, the emails become different. There's different campaigns for that level of customers. So they're moving you through that process until you actually make that sale. Does that help with the product? Yes, thank you. Sure. Looks like we have another question from Kira. Yes, hi, Auntie Kim. So yes. um, I was told it's best to don't go funnel crazy. Focus on the uh, most, I guess, desired product or service of your business. Is that true? Or do, you, um, do you recommend using one sort of product and don't go funnel crazy too? Because I see a lot of businesses, they go funnel crazy and then they can't keep track and they don't know who's who. And then that's when you kind of get frazzled and messed up. So I like using one top product to go make a funnel and do all this marketing, especially being a one woman show in the beginning. Um, so I just want to make note of that or see your thoughts about that. Sure. Those different funnels come from that whole click funnel movement that I talked about earlier with Russell Brunson and having all of these multiple funnels that take you through all of these multiple uh, sales pages. And to give you an illustration of that, if you've ever purchased something, let's say you saw a commercial for vitamins and you went onto the website, you went to place the order, and you said, submit the order. And then a little window pops up and says, if you buy this right now, we'll add a second bottle of vitamins. And you say, no thanks. And they go, and if you buy it right now, we'll do it with no shipping. No thanks. And we have another product we think you'll like that goes with those vitamins that'll make those vitamins even faster, even better. You say, no thanks. And if you want another little window pops up, we can send them to you every month without even thinking about it. That is a funnel. That's the kind of funnel that you're talking about where all of these upsells and there's another word for the uh, one-time offer, or is it a one-time offer? One-time offer windows. Those funnels are very different than what I'm speaking of. Your marketing funnel is one funnel. And it is a literal going through the stages and the process of your marketing. It's not offering you a bunch of different stuff. It's actually just introducing you deeper and deeper into your business or introducing your leads deeper and deeper into your business. Once you once they hit a certain section, when they like when you think of the, the way the, the funnel is segmented, once they reach that certain segment. Now you wanna really start having a sales conversation with them. And that's what I mean where their sales funnel is different. If you were in a situation where you actually had a salesperson, that lead would go through certain levels of your marketing and then be essentially handed over to your salespeople and the salespeople would take over. And that's where their funnel would begin where they take you through the different sales process. They understand what your needs are as a customer. What more does the company have that can serve all of your needs? What is the best thing to sell you right now? And then how do I keep touching you so that you come back and buy? So that's really where you want to think of those two funnels. But those two funnels, the marketing funnel, sales funnel, very, very different than those uh, Click funnels. That answer your question? 
Yes, thank you. Good, good. So how many can you produce in a month? When you're thinking of your production capacity, your co production capacity is directly tied to the amount of revenue you can make in a month. When it's just you, you have to be realistic to say, am I really going to work every single day of the week? Probably not. Some of us do, but we really shouldn't. Am I really going to work 12 hours a day? You should, even if you do, you shouldn't. You really want to be realistic again. Your business model anticipates that you're going to hire somebody to do this work. So you don't want to set up a business model that you can't pay for because you're not going to pay somebody to work 12 hours a day, seven, dollars, seven days a week. You can't afford it. So you have to put yourself in that same window and say, how much can I produce in this particular work schedule? And then compare what you can produce to what you say you want to make a year. Several businesses have come in and said, hey, I want to make $100,000 in a year. So do I. But I'm telling you that if you can't produce the amount of units that's going to give you $100,000 in a year, you're already behind the eight ball. But you have to know that. Very few businesses in our size understand and have calculated what their capacity is. So that's what you want to be able to do on your canvas. How much, how many units can you produce in a month? Multiply that by 12, we'll tell you how many units you can produce in a year. Multiply that by your price per unit, and it'll tell you right there what your revenue is. How many units can you sell in a month? Now that's a little bit different because now you're talking about how do I get my customers, the ones who actually buy? How do I do that? Do they come to me? Do I go to them? I'm saying no business can survive long-term and be very profitable with just inbound sales, meaning DMs and people calling you or texting you. You have to be out here having these sales conversations. You as a business owner have to be out here finding that work for your employees. That is your primary job as a business owner, finding work for your employees. And at this size, we are our own employee. So we have to be out there finding that work so that when the time comes and we do get that, we are in a position to hire, we hand off that functional piece of it and we focus on finding that more work for that new employee. So you have to have a sales process. Just so we talked about this funnel, you have to have a sales process for how those people now become actual paying customers and be realistic about how that process, how you, how you can work that process in a month and calculate how many sales that you're going to get. You'll see a little bit of that too when I send you that document that really breaks down how you can estimate the number of sales based on your number of leads. Does anybody have questions on that? Okay, so we're gonna take a break at this point and then we're going to get into the examples but for next week, you're going to have Citizens Bank talking all that money. That's when you're going to see the PL, profit and loss. You're going to see those balance sheets, all those financial statements. They're going to talk about forecasting your sales, which is something you really want to be as a business owner. That's the seat you want to sit in to be able to understand and predict how much you're going to make based on the sales that you have, either in the month, in a quarter, in a year. And then those uh, operational costs, making sure that you've captured everything. So right now, we're going to go ahead and have that break, say 10 minutes. That's going to put us back here at 6.15-ish. All right. Uh, can I tell you something real quick? Absolutely. 
I went to refer to my homework assignment and I noticed that when I sent you my homework assignment, they're blank. I noticed that too. Girl. So I don't know what I did wrong with typing it in. So I took a picture of all my hard copies so you could see I did my homework. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so I sent it to you so you could see that I did my homework. So just so you know, my hard copies are in your inbox right now. Perfect. I'll take a look at those. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, right, that's all. Kayla, just uh, an FYI, because I know that has happened to me before. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of you having to download the file first, filling it out, and then saving. Sometimes there's still some wonkiness that happens, but try that out. Um, okay. You know, moving forward. And that might I just you. got this iPhone, so I couldn't figure out how to download it. <laughs> I'm not even going to lie to you. My husband already went to work. I was like, crap darn. He didn't show me how to do this. I was trying to figure it out. My girls got school tomorrow, so I was trying to do their hair too. So I had, I was like, oh shoot, let me stop. And I started doing it at like 3.30, trying to figure it out. So I had it all done on the hard copy. So I was trying to put it in on the, on my phone. It, it was my fault. It was all my fault. When in doubt, <laughs> paper is still your friend. Um, I'm yes, that's, that's what I did. I had it done on the hard copy. There you go. I'm team Android, so I can't even help you on the iPhone. But um, yes, I'd have been fine if I had my iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> or if I didn't if I had my Android I'd have been fine but the iPhone it it messed me up girl <laughs> yeah so yeah, yeah I as soon as I saw that I was like uh -uh, let me clip these pictures because I worked too hard on this homework she got to know I had this done <laughs> so my hard copy is in your inbox so you know that I, I I spent like too many hours on this too many hours so yeah I, I sent you <laughs> I sent you the hard copy <laughs> Excellent. I'll take a look um, at this tonight. I have okay. a quick question. Where do we send the homework to? You can send it. You can email it to me. I will drop my email address in the chat. Or, I mean, and I can take a look at it for you. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Awesome. There we are. All right. So now I have a canvas up and this is the canvas for a semi-fictional company. I did, as I mentioned, have an events business, but I wasn't smart enough to do all this canvas stuff at the time. So I was winging it and flinging it and didn't, didn't work. So <laughs> this is, if I had done it right, this is what my canvas might have looked like. Starting with the why. What is your why? So when I said before, your why, first of all, is something that is beyond business. It's how you live your life. It is the core value that you live by. And it is reflected in your business in terms of the type of business you start and how you run that business. So for this canvas, the why is everybody deserves to feel famous at least once in their lives. So think about what that means. If someone, if that's their core value, what kind of events would they do? What kind of company might they have? For instance, you might have a red carpet that comes into your business. So everybody that comes in kind of feels a little like a, oh, okay, you got a red carpet. I'm, I'm important, I'm special. So that's the kind of thing you're thinking about. Your why is the foundation of the culture of your business. So that's really where that, that everybody deserves to feel famous at least once in their lives. How might that manifest itself, both in the business, in terms of internal customers, your employees, but also in terms of how you run your business uh, with your customers. What is your wow? Very simple. We set up parties for rock stars. That means we think all of our clients are rock stars. And we're going to put a, together an event that is fitting a celebrity. So you already know that coming to us, you're not going to see a lot of greenery, a lot of wood, a lot of natural elements. This is going to be bang, pow, in your face, glitter, sparkle everywhere, lights over the top. That's why those words were chosen. So that you know, before you ever do business with them, this is the kind of events that we do. 
What problem does you, do you solve for your customer? We build their popularity and help them gain status. So automatically that tells us some things about our target customer. Status is important to our target customer. Attention, these are people who are not afraid of attention. They want attention. They, they're looking to post this and be the next viral Instagram post with their party. So you're gonna crank that up. Those are the people that we're looking for. Does that mean no one else can do business with us? Absolutely not. Your 75 year old grandma might want a over the top party for her 80th. We'll do that, but that's not our target customer. When we look at our marketing and we look at who we seek out when we're having those sales conversations, it's people who are active on social media people who are looking to really put themselves out there and have their event be put out there. How does your product or service solve the customer's problem? I translate their vision into a decorated space that makes people go crazy. That's a pretty bold statement. So that's, again, letting you know, along with that culture, we're out here to really put something on that's going to make the news. That's the goal. So does everybody see that with that section of the of the the canvas? Anybody have questions on how they're filling out their canvas because this goes into that pitch deck that we're going to be doing. Who is your customer? How do you solve their problem? What is their problem? Once again, their problem has nothing to do with the literal problem that you do with your business. If you have a cleaning company, their problem is not that they have a dirty house. Their problem is that they want to spend more time doing other things and that house just kind of gets in the way. And you're solving that problem by giving them that time back, by freeing them up to do those other things they want to do. So who is my target customer? Busy professionals, social, social media people, and young moms. People who really want to get out here and promote stuff. And I see there's a question. So people who really want to, um, yes, you asked for an example of this canvas. This canvas, along with the spreadsheet we're going to go over tonight, will be sent to you. But this is, again, talking about who those specific people are I'm going to talk to with my marketing. Who am I going to seek out when I place it? When I say I want to be where those people are, these are the people that I'm going to be looking for to get in front of them as my target customer. So now some of you talked about the different revenue streams. How does my business generate revenue? I can do event decoration. I sell an event planning workbook with a spreadsheet and I do event rentals. Now I will say this, and again, I'm not sure if I said this last week on the call or on the class or on the office hours call, but if you have a business, you have a service-based business, you should have a product to, to sell with it. If you have a product-based business, you should have a service that people can use to, with your product uh, as, a, as a companion. Why is that? That's that vertical that we talked about. You want to make sure that you can service your customer more than once. You want to find ways that you can be of service to your customer. Sometimes that's adding a little bit of here, that's having something that's available to them there. Think about how they use your product. How can you add to that and that be a revenue stream? And then how much revenue per unit? Event decoration is 5666. Event planning workbook is 2495. Event rental 750. And we're going to see the worksheet of how those numbers were calculated as we go on here. Does anybody have any questions before we slide over to the other side of this canvas? Okay, then we will slide over to the other side of this canvas. Um, I do have a question. I'm okay with everything we're going over. Just before we leave the canvas, can you kind of like 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like move it back so I can see the entire canvas completed. Oh, and kind of like screenshot it so it can kind of help me with what I'm working on as well. I'm actually going to send this out so you'll have this canvas along with the spreadsheet that shows the number so you can be able to type in your numbers and uh, replace what's in there. So we slide over here. So we talk about how much does it cost to create or produce one unit? So for event decoration, it's $3,483 to produce uh, that one unit. For your event planning workbook, five bucks. And that's just for the ads because it was a, it's already created. I don't need to do anything more to it. When somebody wants it, it's already set up to be sent to them. The event rentals, those are things I already own. So the only fee associated with that is the cleaning before and after. Indirect costs, it's just me in the business. So I have my web hosting and maintenance, storage, because I have to have some place to put all that stuff. It's way too much for my house. Utilities, internet, cell phone, advertising, office supplies, storage bins to transport the things back and forth, insurance, tools, that comes up to about $29.75 per month. So that's really how you wanna, and this, uh, I'm just trying to remember if this that I send you will have that list of, uh, yes, the list of direct and indirect expenses is one of the things that I'll be sending. So does anybody have questions on this part? I know it's kind of specific to this business, but that's pretty much how that gets calculated. I did that again. All right, I see a question. Rashamari Cologne. Yeah, you said it right, thank you. <laughs> so my question is, I'm looking at your indirect costs and then the pro, um, to create for one unit. So now when you are doing your indirect cost the 29.75 a month, this is only for one unit. Obviously you probably do more than one event inside of the month. So were you doing a percentage of your indirect cost to go with the units or is that going separately altogether? I hope I said that right. You did, but we missed the introduction. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping I didn't have to do it. No. <laughs> Um, my name is Rasha Marie Cologne. I am the owner of Rockin' Inspirations. Um, it definitely has evolved. We used to do um, planning and decorations as well before, but then we changed and now I do customs. So custom tumblers and t-shirts and things like that. Um, working with anybody who is looking to purchase a gift or um, I always say, just to purchase a custom item that takes it ordinary to extraordinary status. That has always been my tagline. Um, it went from gifts only to now being able to offer um, customs in different areas. There's over a hundred crafts that we have been working with. Um, but what I'm looking to do is possibly just kind of cut it down because it's only me. It takes a lot of time to do customs. Obviously, we send out our items to vendors so that they can complete it, but you're losing out on that profit, obviously, because you're the middleman. Um, but I'm looking into the blanks part of it to help individuals start their own businesses so that way they could come to me for the items that they need for their customs. So if they need t-shirts, I would have the blank t-shirts. If they wanted to do some type of other custom item, then we would be able to supply that. But obviously. There's that overhead, you know, storage and shipping from across seas and things like that. So I've been kind of up in the air. Um, we actually moved from New York. We are now in Georgia. Um, so we are running into a lot of individuals who are coming from different countries that speak Spanish. I speak Spanish. So I said, Lord, I need some help. And I'm very community oriented. So I'm like maybe translation interpreting services may benefit us 
more where we can meet people because I feel like I've been a homebody ever since doing customs. You can just contact me online, but um, I really want to give back to the community. So I'm really asking the Lord for his guidance, um, maybe going into bookkeeping just to have that as a income flow, but really get into um, advocacy for the Spanish speaking community. So I'm kind of up in the air. So Hear that. I think this is going to help me kind of really put it all in perspective and be able to kind of plan something out because it is something that is a need here. I believe there's only one other organization that does it cur um, currently. And um, as I was working as a substitute in the schools, they were saying that the Hispanic population is growing very quickly from individuals coming from different countries. And there's not many Spanish speaking um, teachers or even helpers, interpreters or anything like that where they can, you know, reach out to. So I was like, well, I love helping. I love youth. And I think that will be something that might um, kind of turn the tables from just creating t-shirts, mm -hmm. actually being a, of a help to the community. That's a lot. <laughs> so, so I would say, uh, again, I think we mentioned last week, really focus in and, and find a lane, figure out what your lane is, and then be the best in that lane. So when I, when I hear your custom items, are those specifically for the Hispanic community? Nope, that is a, you know, all around community. Um, we haven't really like just focused on one specific ethnicity when it comes to the custom items because anyone can reach out and say hey I want a t-shirt that says xyz on it I think I did cut my limit as to I wouldn't put any profanity or things that kind of go against what we preach because we're pastors as well um and it's the reason why we are in Georgia now um but it is a lot. It is over a hundred items that we can customize. And it's such a big thing that, okay, one person might want a tumbler, somebody else might want a keychain, somebody, and I don't have time. Like, I don't necessarily have the time for it. I love doing it, but I like working with people more. So um, the branding aspect of it, just for businesses, like, let me help you create a item for your suitcase. So when you go out on vacation, your suitcase can have a cover. This is the name of your business. And you can take that wherever you want with you. And I think it's more of putting people out there. I love the outreach aspect of it, helping people build up their businesses. I like being in the back. Like, let me connect you with somebody and then I'll stay quiet and I'll just stay in the back and you guys can keep it going. Um, <laughs> But I think it's very important for the businesses to get out there, not hide, but, you know, your T-shirt with your name of your business on it. So people can be like, hey, wait a minute. Oh, what type of business is that? Where are you going um, when they're on vacation? You know, they have those items with them and people are saying, oh, my goodness, you do this, you do this. So I really feel like, you know, helping out the businesses, but just being an advocate, I think it's just like my my really thing that I like to do. Well, just listening, first of all, 100 items is way too much, mm -hmm. way too much. So I would say, again, look at what's selling. Look at what's really selling and what you really want to be the brand for your business. What do you want to be the go-to person for? Narrow that down to maybe, maybe 10 items. And I'm saying, if you're looking for advocacy, working with the community, there's there's two sides to that. One is I would recommend, and this is something that I would do if I were you, really focus in that Hispanic community because now you've got a specialty. Now you are the person that's like, yeah, I could go anywhere, but this, this is the only place I can get this stuff from. And then second, have a class. Remember we have, if you have a product, you mm -hmm. should have a service. If you have a service, you should have a product. So give a class on one of those things that you cut out, one of those 90 other items that you customize and say, I'm going to start teaching people how to do these three things and have a class on that. So now you're getting out with the community. 
you're creating, you're making money, you're tying it to your business. It's all still part of the same brand because you don't want to con create confusion in the marketplace mm -hmm. where people don't know what they should come to you for. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could come to you for your bookkeeping plus my t-shirt plus a uh, translation. And mm -hmm. you want to be able to really, again, pick that lane, be the best you can possibly be in that lane so that you are top of mind when people want that particular product or service. Great. Thank you. Now to go back to your question, you're going to your indirect costs are separate from that 3483. That 3483 is direct. This goes back to the sandwich bags that we talked about. That number all the numbers in this column or in this space should be the costs that are directly related to your product or service. The indirect costs are those things, like I said, the rent, regardless of how many sandwiches you make, that rent stays the same. Then when we get up into the top and we're talking about the profits and the calculations, then you're going to see that you got to have some of that similar to what we talked about with your uh, tools, with the vacuum cleaner. You gotta have a percentage of that in your costs. So with that, that vacuum cleaner would be part of your direct cost because that's directly tied to that cleaning job. So a portion of that would be included in that cost. Does that make sense? All right, any other questions? We're going to move up here to how you generate leads. This business generate leads through Facebook ads, Facebook demos. Those are a great way to kind of get out there and let your people see who you are, what you do and establish you as an expert. People do business with you. I'm sure you've heard three things. Know, like, trust. They have to know you, have to like you, have to trust you. These Facebook events and these live events are ways that they can quickly say, who is this person? Do they know what they're talking about? Can they help me with whatever problem that I have? Do they even really understand what problem I have? So that's where this, the demos come in. For this business, they might do a quick tablescape to show you how to make a quick tablescape that looks fabulous and put in you. So when the next time you have a dinner party, you can kind of be the, the star of the show. Networking events, understand what's going on in your industry. Don't just be have tunnel vision on your particular business, not even your particular city. You wanna understand what's going on in the industry. So find trade associations, memberships that you can get that will put you into groups, large groups of people about what's going on in your industry. So when you're out there networking, those are great ways that people can say, hey, I know people in your area who, do, who need this, that, and the other. Here's someone who's a supplier who might help you lower your costs for this, that, and the other. And then also net, local networking events where you might find customers. But networking events are not sales events. They literally are places where you go to find out how you can help other people. That's how you get success in a networking event. Word of mouth, that's an easy one. Posting pictures, people talking about your party, and now everybody else wants to come and hire you. That's how that business generates leads. How many units can you produce in a month? That really comes down to capacity. This is per someone who's saying, I don't wanna be working every single weekend at a party. So I'm going to do three Saturday, three Fridays and three Saturdays a month because that's what I am able to do. The event planning workbook, that's sleeping money. People can buy that. I don't even have to be there. I don't even have to pay attention to it. It just happens and the money is in my account. Love those types. Event rentals, there's work that I have to do for that. And if I'm doing 
if I'm working three Fridays and three Saturdays, then I can't spend every week also gathering rentals, getting them cleaned, getting them boxed and sending them out. So I'm going to limit my limit for event rentals is four in a month. How many can you sell in a month? So I could sell 14 in a month. If I were to sell every Saturday, every Friday, and do two events on Saturday, I could sell 14. So immediately, what do you see? There's a capacity issue. That means money on the table. That means I'm turning down business. That means that's a cue that it might be time for me to hire somebody because I could be doing 14 events in a month, but I can't with just me, I can only do six. So if you can sell 14 in a month, find a way to build that capacity to 14 in a month. Obviously again, the ebook is unlimited. Your event rentals, same deal. I'm leaving money on the table. Find a way to hire someone to meet this capacity. Because if you can sell that, most people have the opposite problem. They can work 12, but they can only sell four. So when you, can, when you have this problem, and that's part of what this canvas is gonna show you, it's time to hire somebody. It's time to hire them and pay that use these extra four event rentals and extra eight decorations to cover their salary. Anybody have questions on that? Uh, Kim, there's a question in the chat uh, mm -hmm. from Yasmin. It says, for people that provide services, the units produced will be the amount of hours you can work in a month, uh, or will the units produced be uh, the amount of hours you can work in a month. And she yes. says uh, she doesn't sell any products. Right. This is this is a service business that you're seeing here. This canvas is a, set, a service business, event decorating. So that is, again, that capacity. There's only so much I can do. And I'm going to switch over to the Excel spreadsheet to show you where some of those hours and, and numbers came from. So is everybody seeing a work product breakdown spreadsheet right now? All right. So if we go here, let me increase it a little bit. So she broke her business down into three packages because it was so much that could be done, but she needed to get it down to a unit. And not everybody's gonna pick just one package. So this, the hours that she's selected and the price she selected for her calculations is an average of these packages, which you're gonna see a little bit below. But she has a $2,000 package that takes her three hours to set up. She has a $5,000 package that takes her five hours to set up. And then she has a $10,000 package that takes her nine hours to set up. So what she did is she did an average to say, these three packages divided by three gives me five, six, six, seven. And this is when it's rounded up, but that's the five, six, six, six. That's on the previous canvas for the price per unit. The hours per unit is these hours, the three hours, the five hours, and the nine hours also divided by three. And that gives her the 567. Does everybody see that? So that's how you, if you have multiple offerings, you want to take those units and do an average, but I would caution you against having 25 different offerings. You really want to find a way to narrow that down as much as possible. And you do that by looking at what's selling. 
Don't have things on your list that one person bought one time or two people bought one time. You really wanna say what's truly selling and let me focus on that because that's your customer base telling you this is what we want. Take that, make those into units and do that averaging so you can create, or excuse me, uh, put your calculations together for what your costs are for that particular unit. Does anyone have questions on that? Okay, so now we're gonna pop over to where we actually did the calculations. So here she says, I have 32 hours available. That is three Fridays, three Saturdays. And it's just one person. So that time available times the people available divided by your price, or excuse me, your hours per unit, that tells you your capacity for the month. That is six cups, six events or six units per month that this one person can produce. Does everybody have that? Okay, so now based on that, you have six units that you can produce in a month. The average price of those units is five, six, six, seven. So in a month, the maximum amount of revenue that you can generate with that one person is $34,000. So you got that? No questions? Okay, so now we said our indirect costs were $29.75. That's the overhead. That's the rent, the utilities, the storage, the bins, the cell phone, $29.75 a month. We divide that by the unit price minus the direct costs. The unit price is what your customer pays you. Your direct costs are what it costs you. So that remaining that unit price minus just direct costs is gonna give you your profit. And you divide that by your overhead costs, that gives you your break even number. This is a very important number for you, especially at our size. What that number tells you is this is how much I need to generate to cover all my costs. I won't make any money, but I don't lose any money at that point. It's the break even number. This is the number that if I meet that, I'm good in terms of. I don't owe anybody, I'm not in the red, I'm not negative, but I'm not profitable either. So we gotta take that a step further, but for the, this is the first part that you need to make. Consistently, am I breaking even? So now we're gonna look at profit. If you have six events a month, the average price of those events is 5667. That means your revenue, the money that you, your gross pay is $34,002. But when you subtract your costs, which is that 3483 from the canvas, 2184 is what you actually end up with as profit. So six events times the 2184 gives you $13,104 as profit. Does everybody get that calculation? Because it's literally just the same for each unit. So your revenue for the month is $37,000 for all three of these products. The profit for the month is $15,543. Does everybody get that? Kim, I just have a quick question um, myself, kind of rewinding. Sure. Um, when you say the break-even number is 1.4, is that in units? That is units. That is, you must do essentially one and a half 
units every month, <coughs> excuse me, in order to break even. Okay, gotcha. All right, thank you. Oh, it looks like Ashley has her hands up. Okay, hello, Ashley. Hey, Kim. It's my, okay, my camera's on. Let me go to my notepad because I have my sentence written down. Okay. My name is Ashley Escobar, and I'm the owner of Angelic Love and Light. As a holistic healer, I help women, men, and children looking for a deeper level of healing in their body, mind, and soul, helping to create more balance by providing holistic alternative wellness to prevent illness, disease, and unfulfillment in life. That's a lot. I know. <laughs> so we can work to simplify that because the first part of it men, women, children, what's the, what's, what else is there? Well, so I didn't want to, I did have a, I did have a very general word and I felt like that was too general and that you would have told me to get more specific. So then I put men, women, and children because I do work with all three populations. Right. But who within that population what are what's special about the people in that population that they would need your services? They either um, have been through major traumas or have illness. Okay, so that's the the angle that you want to go to to really make that specific. Because okay. if men, women, and children, if, if I'm a woman, okay, I'm I'm in that group, but. I still don't know that I fit your target customer. Very good. I will fix that. My question is on the break even number. For those of us with multiple unit prices, would we do that calculation for each one for the break even number? Yes. That's what I thought. I just wanted to verify. Mm -hmm. Because Thank you. what you would want to know is like you can turn that dial any way you want to. If you had, if your break-even number for events is 1.4, your break-even number for your planning book might be 25, your break-even number for your event rentals might be three. So if you know you need to have a specific nut that you need to meet, and by nut, I mean your monthly number, you might say, well, I'll sell more books this month because I'm not gonna sell as many events this month. Or I might sell more events and not sell any books and not do any rentals. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions on there? We do have a question in the chat, Kim. Uh, mm -hmm. It's from Ms. Sky Johnson. Let's see, it says, what if I have a service business where I can get revenue quickly and most of my inventory that I use is being used often? What if it's the type of business where I'm making more deposits than having to break down the cost for everything? Can we hear from Sky? Sky, feel free to bring yourself off mute. Hi, my, uh, my name is Sky Johnson. I'm the owner of Up in the Sky. I have a character business. So when you were talking about a party business, I have a costume character business. So I have over 22 characters. Most of them are used, you know, often a person calls, they say, hey, do you have Mickey Mouse? Hey, do you have Coco Melon? You know, et cetera, et cetera. I'll say yes. You know, I'll give them the price. You know, I ask, you know, is it a boy or girl? I do bring gifts for the child. Usually they're under like $5. So it could be like coloring book crayons, you know, cars, baby dolls that type of thing um you know my target people are you know of course kids of course you know parents that may want this service at their child birthday party and um I would say probably for like the last six months I would say the target has been like community so you know community action organization might have an event they may want to book me um, with Catholic charities, you know, Buffalo Public Schools, you know, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't brought, I haven't brought a character since March. Mm -hmm. So all 22 characters I have at home, you know, they've been used, you know, constantly. I might have my top five that go out, 
you know, every week or, you know, every month or, you know, um, like I said, it's when you said indirect costs and stuff, you know, it's basic, you know, like gas, you know, it may be basic, like, you know, I at home, you know, I clean them. Um, if I have like a young worker with me, I would say like teenage, you know, I will pay them, you know, under the table, you know, out of pocket or it's, I would say right now it's more like basic because I'm not, I would say I'm not putting out a lot to like put out even more if that make any sense. It's just, it's kind of just like the same, you know, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I did invest in a bounce house um, back in April. I finally did that, you know, in June. Mm -hmm. Like I said, if it's something that, that do I want to do it all the time? No. Will I do it if a customer asks? Yes. You know, um, I don't know, like I invested in a new vehicle. I invested in a van because I felt like my characters taking over my car, you know? <laughs> I invested in shelves for the room because, you know, I have suits and I have bodies. I just feel like I may say that it's a business, but like I said, it's a quick revenue. Cause, you know, You're I don't great. know, I could. Oh, sorry. Um. I can do like six parties, you know, in a weekend if I want to do. Um, I don't know. I just feel like I'm trying to figure out like, is it, it's like a quick revenue service, but I just feel like I don't have like the breakdown fees. Right. Because my first question is, what is, do you have insurance covered in that cost? No. Uh, and that's something like, I'm not going to lie. That's something that, you know, I'm definitely, you know, willing to get. Like when you were talking about like domains and websites, it's like stuff like that I need to get. So I'll basically tell you like, I need to put on the big girl panties and, you know, get the big stuff. Like, you know, the money is there. It The money is not an issue. The money is there, but I just have to get the big girl stuff. You know, mm -hmm. the, the revenue ain't a problem. Like I could pay you, you could pay me. I can make deposits. I put it in the business account. I get the, the gifts. We And that's the thing, like when you were talking about what's your wow, my wow is after the party like once I come out the suit they be like oh my god that was good or oh my god we want you back or or you know like you know it's like when the character hit the street it's like we can't even walk down the street because the kids are seeing the character and they like oh shoot you know it's blues clues like you know we touching the you know once you hit whatever party you at it's like you can't even get through the door like that's my wife so you know I'm so here's mm -hmm. what I would say for you. And this is for all the people who also work with children. Your children are your end user. Mm -hmm. but your customer is the parent because mm -hmm. it's the customer that's paying you, the parent that's paying you. So your kids, are, the kids are going to be like, oh my gosh, yes, great. So what is it that you're doing for the parent? And again, it's benefit. Thanks for really the parent know the benefit I think for the parent I think it's the quality of the costume I'm not gonna lie like you know it's you know it's good like you know it don't look cheesy um I feel like it's the dancing like I mean we dance I mean it's like a show so your show is probably your wow your benefit is to the parent is you make that parent a hero mm hmm that parent gets to bring blues clues to their kid's parent to their kid's party. Imagine how that kid is looking at their parent and they're, they're rolling that in there like saying, I did that. I did that for you. And that kid is like, oh my gosh, you did that for me. Mm -hmm. You get to be so that parent gets to feel like the hero of their kid's story. That's your benefits. Those are the benefits that you want to look for. The kids are your, as your end user, they're going to go crazy all the time, every day. But the kids aren't putting the money on the table. No, which they're not. No, I agree, which it is the parent. But I will say, like you said, I think it's that meet and greet and I think it's the show. Like it's the performance. It's, you know, once we put on the music, you know, we going to show up and show out. Like how you said, is your business a vitamin? Or is it a problem solver? Sometimes I feel like it's a problem solver because it could be the most boring party in the world. But as soon as I step through the door, it's like, boom, like, you know, <laughs> it's over. Like, that's it. Right. Exactly. Um, so that, again, somebody could hire 
a, a character to come to their party and that character can walk through mm -hmm. and pat people on the head and wave their hands. And yeah, that's great. But sounds like you come kaboom, guess who stepped in the room and we about to put a show on and you're gonna know we're here. And when we leave that whole party, the vibe of that whole party has changed. There goes your wow. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's it. That's right. But now, so now you got that down. Now you have to turn that into how do I use that to generate leads? How do I turn those leads into sales? Mm -hmm. How do I intentionally do outbound sales and get people coming in? Sounds like you now are dri are uh, venturing into community events and things mm -hmm. like that. The more you get into that, the more you got to have that paperwork in order. That means they want to see insurance. That means they want to see that you have your business structure, a legal business structure. That means if you have employees, they want to see workers comp because okay. the last thing they want to do is get sued because mm -hmm. somebody fell over in your suit and okay. hurt a kid. Okay, which is acceptable. And those are the costs that now go into your direct costs. Okay. All righty. Um, okay. Um, the other thing I just wanted to add, what if it's like a wow moment, like this year I just took the chance and I ordered an Easter bunny suit. Mm -hmm. So when I ordered that, like you know, the parents was like, and it, it, this is the thing, I ordered the suit, anybody can order the suit, but what I did that was different, like, when you were talking about, like, Apple, and what, you know, what product may be different, what I did was, like, I'm like, okay, most people go to the mall to take Easter money with their kids, I brought the Easter money to the house, mm -hmm. in the people living room, and I said, hey, y'all take as many pictures as y'all want, so, you know, y'all don't have to pay for the packages at you know, the gallery of mall or, you know, wherever you stay at, or, you know, go to whatever Broadway market and whatever. I came with the soup to the house with a speaker, danced with the kids around the living room. You took whatever pictures and I was out. And when I did that, it was like, a um, like I didn't come long. It was like for like 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, they paid whatever dollars. What I didn't like was that the Easter bunny brought a gift and it was too time consuming for me because it took too much time. Mm -hmm. so I felt like that was my um I think you like the funnel like that was just like the downfall just for me like it it took to so I want to do something again for Halloween where you know I might bring Frankenstein or whatever to like Halloween parties I just wouldn't bring a gift maybe I bring candy in a basket well again you determine that you are the owner so mm -hmm. you get to decide what your business is and what your brand is but one thing you should be really thinking about is what is your why? What's that core value that you can use that permeates every single interaction you have in that business so that you can then also translate that to your workers so that one day you get to sit home and one day very soon sounds like you could be sitting at home watching whatever you like to watch and all these people are out making you money at all these parties because you, they have your brand. They know how to represent your company out in front of your customers. And that comes from a solid established why. Why do we do what we do? Got and it. that's the foundation of the culture of your company. Got it. Thank you. Sure. So one quick thing, we are over, but I just want to do this one quick calculation here. We say, this is how much you want to make a year, $200,000. That's divided by 12, the number of months in a year. That means you have to make $16,000 a month in order to make that $200,000. So now if you look over here, you can see this person is, a cl is close. They're making $15,543 a month. If they hired that person from that canvas where we talked about leaving money on the table, they would easily be able to reach their goal of $200,000 a year. But by doing this calculation, you also get to see how far away you are, what is a realistic goal for the capacity that you have, 
And how can I bring somebody else on? What, how much more do I need to make before I can bring somebody else on and expand that and start to really scale? Scaling is a big old popular word right now, but really you have to perfect it small first. You have to get that machine running perfectly as a small company, and then you scale that perfection. Don't get out here and trying to figure, you're still trying to figure things out and scale at the same time. I have questions on this? You're gonna get this along with that canvas, along with the list of direct and indirect costs. And you're gonna, uh, I think that's all that we talked about tonight. But if there's anything else, certainly let me know. I have a lot, of, I'm a data hoarder, so I have a lot of stuff. I don't see that anyone has any additional questions. If you do, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone, I know some people have had some issues receiving emails and such. So please add Kim's email as well as mine. Um, to your safe contacts, and hopefully that'll prevent it from falling into the junk folder or spam folder. Um, I will go ahead and add that into the chat right now as well, just in case. So there goes mine, and let me get Kim's out to you in just a second. Um, and I see we have a question from Raylin. Or Raylin? It's Raylin. It's actually my mom sharing the computer oh. with me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Leela Kelly and uh, Raylan and I are beginning, we are the beginning owners of a business concept that's still in ideation. So uh, we have come along on this course so that we can really think through the, um, the development of the business and uh, make sure that we're um, considering all the relevant um, aspects. Um, and what we did, we did the homework. It was taxing because we are at ideation. We had an ideal um, based on my mother's past work. Um, and um, when I looked at the questions, who do we help? What we came up with was luxury seeking, eco and social conscious, individuals who parent hmm. so we did not want to say moms and dads because we know we live in an environment where grandparents are taking care of are raising grandchildren you've got foster families you've got you've got all different types of families so we really didn't know how to word that and make someone feel like well, that's not for me because I'm not a mom, I'm not a dad, but I am parenting. And so it would be for them. So um, that is something that we really wanted to ask about how best to describe that. Why not uh, just parents? Parents, would you consider them parents if they were so, uh, if they're uncles or aunts that are parenting, you would consider them parents? Just they say parenting. Huh? They are parenting, right? Mm -hmm. You could also say people raising children. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we had that. that. <laughs> we, we had that. And we, and we thought, okay, is that clear enough? It can't okay. get clearer than that. <laughs> okay, okay. And so um, when we looked at the, uh, the what, um, what we have, what we whittled it down to is a luxury brand, children's product um, with um, an e-community service. But as we talk about simplifying, what, what is it? So as a, I'm not raising children right now, but even if I were to say, I wanna refer you to someone who's raising children, I don't know what you do from that phrase. Okay. Okay, so what we what what we would do? My mother um, is all throughout our lives. She always made baby blankets, and she would take them to hospitals. She would take them to health centers. She would take them to um, um, foster care 
and, and children's homes. And she always felt that in the winter, a child needed its, its own winter blanket. They needed a blanket. And, um, and so now she's older and she's, she's losing her sight. And so she can no longer make the blankets. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it might be a great idea for us to take that concept and um, make it eco-friendly, more sustainable pro uh, a product, um, be equal-minded, um, conscious. And also one of the things, my mother was a victim of domestic violence. So we wanted to put a philanthropic bin to the product. And so we looked at the concept like Tom's, um, the buy one, get one. Yeah. So for every blanket we sell, we wanted to donate a blanket to a domestic violence shelter for a child. So that's kind of the product and the service. And, and we wanted to put a service with it. So uh, e-community service where there would be resources for parents, um, a place for them to um, dialogue with one another, build association, build community, um, gain insights and resources, and just really be able to become a, a community on our site as well. Since you're in the ideation phase, what I would recommend is do some focus groups. Get some, <laughs> get some people together, explain what it is that your what your concept is, and, and not just anybody. What you want to be thinking about is again starting with parents, but you added luxury, you added eco in there those people that would probably be your tribe, get them to the table, explain what it is you have and help them, let them help you really zero in on what it should be. It's a lot going on and you want to understand those two things. Is it a problem for a lot of people and are those people willing to pay for it? Most especially if you're planning on giving away a product, you need to know that you're making enough profit that you're essentially making two blankets for the cost of one, or the cost is double, but you're only getting a revenue for one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what else do we have on here? I think that's pretty much, do we that have covered it? it? I think mm -hmm. they covered it. Good thing. Thank you. Sure, sure. Does anyone else have questions? All right, well then we will wrap it up. Remember we do have office hours Thursdays, 5.30 to eight, whatever questions you have on this, on business, on your uh, ideas, 5.30 to eight, the link is in your, you should have received it last week actually, if you didn't, Drop me an email or drop it in the chat. I'll make sure you get the link and we will wrap it up for this evening and get ready for next week. Awesome. Do we have homework? We do not have homework. No. Look at you asking for homework. <laughs> All right. Every week. Yeah, I was expecting Listen, it. Everybody else is like, no. Shut up, shut up. <laughs> that part. <laughs> Just, just make sure you finish up what was provided in the first week. So if there are any tweaks right. that you need to make, make those tweaks. Yeah, I will do that. I will do that. All right. Have Thank a you, everyone. Day. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.